a warm welcome to all of you to our today's Trainers Thursday session about ideas for teaching your first SNAP workshop. I hope you're not too much confused. Um, we've just seen the after movie of last year's um, well, a Young Thinkers Learning Festival at the SNAPCon. So today it's not the Young Thinkers Learning Festival, but the Trainers Thursday. But the Young Thinkers Learning Festival last year has shown us how many diverse workshops you can do with kids in SNAP. And this also in a completely virtual setup. So therefore, thank you so much to our four speakers today for taking the time and um, rocking this session for you. Um, welcome to Yatka, Jan, Clea and Kuba. Um, who will lead you today through the session. Um, but first of all, because uh, before I hand over to Jatka, uh, let's have a quick look at the agenda. After this welcome, Jatka from the SNAP team will start with a general introduction into SNAP today and will then hand over to Jan from the Educational University of Heidelberg, who will tell you something about SNAP and coding, SNAP coding and art and um, their girls' digital camps in which they are using SNAP and art. Afterwards, Claire will take over with some experiences and around gaming with SNAP with kids. And last but not least, um, Kuba will take over with some general best practices, experience as hurdles in a virtual workshop setup um, before we will have a short closing together. So, now, before I hand over to Jatka, one last thing. We want to hear a little bit more about with whom we are dealing with today and therefore prepared a short poll on how experienced you are with SNAP so far. And I will launch it just now. So we just want to ask you, have you ever worked with SNAP before? Yes, I'm kind of an expert. Yes, from time to time. Yes, but not that often or never before. I've seen a lot of, of um, responses. Almost everyone has responded. Okay. I have an advantage right now because I see the um, I see the results. Okay, I shared with you, I think we're a mixed uh, field of participants. So, Jatka, Jan, Claire, and Kuba, that's with whom you're dealing with today. And now, the stage is yours, Jatka. Um, thanks, Caro. I'll share my screen. Um, and I'll, although I think when you want to do a SNAP workshop, you might already heard of SNAP before, um, I will still give a short overview. So everyone is on the same page. Um, so this is a SNAP webpage. You can find SNAP at snap.berkeley.edu and uh, you can run SNAP directly in your web browser in basically any browser. Some things don't really work in Safari, but um, with Chrome and Firefox, you're definitely fine. You can access SNAP by clicking on run SNAP here. And the cool thing about SNAP, so there's different things that I will mention now. Um, some are obvious, like it's a visual programming language where you program by dragging and dropping together these pieces of code that we call blocks. We have the blocks in different categories here in this left part, which we call the palette. Um, so, and the blocks are differently colored based on what they do. So the motion blocks, for example, um, will make the sprite, the object that we program here, move on the stage. I click on that block now and you can see that it moves on that stage part. Bennett usually explains it with the metaphor of an actor or actress and I kind of like that a lot. So we are the directors of a screenplay and the screenplay is happening on the stage here and our sprites are the actors in the play that we um, want to give to the audience and we can give directors hints and inputs on, and commands by dragging and dropping blocks into that center part. I clicked on that block now and you can see that you get immediate feedback. So the sprite moves, it turns, it turns back. 
Um, that's the second thing I wanted to mention. Snap is a live programming environment, which means you can try everything out right away and you get immediate feedback. So in case something is not working, you can just try to click on it and see what's wrong or well, what's right. <laughs> Hopefully it works. Or you can just try out different things to see what they do. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is um, that Snap's also a parallel programming language, which means that I can run several scripts or sprites at the same time. So for example, I could create a script that says whenever the space key is pressed, um, forever move one step. And then I could have another script that also runs with the space key and does something forever. Um, and what the second script will do is um, it will turn two degrees all the time. So when I press space now, you can see that the sprite is moving and it is turning at the same time. And the same is also true if I create another sprite, I can also run them in parallel. So the three main things, um, it's a block space programming language, which means you program by dragging and dropping blocks together. It's a live programming language, which means I can click on anything to try it out. So for example, I can click here while the script is running and it's a parallel programming language, which means that several sprites and several um, scripts can run at the same time. But that's also true for some other educational programming languages. So now I wanted to mention what makes Snap special. And there's, there are a lot of things, but some of the most important ones for us are the fact that you can create your own functions. So you can write custom blocks that report values. For example, I could do a, let's just try one real quick, a sum block, um, which takes an input of numbers um, and it reports the sum of all those numbers. Um, and I can do that by combining the list of numbers using the plus block. You don't, there's no need to follow along. I just wanted to show it real quick. Um, and if I click okay now, I have my sum block here and then I can now input a bunch of numbers. So let's do, I don't know, one, three, four, six. And when I click on that block, I get a result. So I can write custom functions. I could also write custom control structures if I wanted, but that's a little sophisticated for today maybe. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention is that we, um, can have multi-dimensional lists. So we can make lists of lists and two-dimensional lists are tables. One table that I wanted to show you is um, images and I will go into that a little more later. So here's an image of me. Oh, maybe I'll stop the scripts. Here's an image of me. And we could go to the center and point it to the right. Oh, wow. I look a little strange. Anyways, um, I can now access the pixels of that costume and you can see that this is a table. So it's a table of 172,800 pixels and a table is nothing but a, a list of lists. So every entry here is a pixel and a pixel is nothing but a list of four color transparency channels. Um, and the last thing that I just wanted to mention is variable scope. So we also have local variables, which we think um, is important to do actual computer science. Um, and now I wanted to give you some ideas on what I think is useful for running your own SNAP workshops. And I prepared this um, little presentation um, where I wanted to give you um, some ideas. Okay, let me try that. So the first idea is, start with simple projects, but not just simple projects. There are simple projects that also have big results that look beautiful, that do something interesting, although the code is pretty simple. And one I wanted to show you is, let me just create a new project here, is the random walk. So for example, you make your sprite move around the stage randomly. Whenever it touches the edge, it would just turn around to another direction and it will always turn a little bit randomly and it will draw all that. It sounds a little complicated, but it's not at all. So the first step is we want to forever make our sprite move around the stage. If I do it like that, I of course will lose the sprite. So whenever it touches the edge, I want it to bounce. Now I need to get some angle into the um, direction of the sprite. So it doesn't only turn left or right. So maybe, so maybe we'll add a little turn block here. 
and turn one degree each time. To see what we're actually doing, we can just draw it by putting the pen down. So this kind of looks interesting and now I want to add the randomness. So we always want to turn a random um, number of degrees. Now we can do that by adding blocks from the operators category and we add the pick random block and let me just do minus three to three here. And whenever we turn, we pick a random number of degrees that we want to turn and maybe also let's move something a little smaller and clear again. So this is a super simple project that creates interesting artifacts and we can even change the color each time. So for example, whenever we pick, uh, whenever we um, walk around with our sprite, we change the pen color slightly. Um, let's use the change pen hue block and we change the hue by one every time. So we now get differently colored um, things and we could, for example, also change other things. And th by that, we get interesting artifacts by only using five or six blocks. The pen category in general is pretty good for starting things. Um, and Jan will tell you more about that in a minute. So the second thing I wanted to mention is accommodate everyone. So people have different tastes on what they want to do in workshops. For kids, it's usually games. So Claire will tell you more about games. I personally don't like games at all. and in all workshops, there are other kids that are not that much into gaming. So maybe have a backup idea on what you might want to do with them. What I usually find very good is um, stuff with images. So I, oh, I lost it. Uh, let me create another image. Um, uh, you can use the webcam feature in Snap or you can just drag and drop stuff um, in from your computer into Snap. Um, and what's always really nice is doing interactive projects and funny things. So a, a really good starter project, wait, let me put that to the center again, is um, using the built-in um, graphic effects from the looks category. So in the looks category, we have all the blocks that have to do with how our sprite looks. So we can change costumes there and we can apply graphic effects. So for example, here we have the ghost effect, color effect, saturation effect, brightness effect. And the one I want to show you now is the fish eye effect. And I can set that fish eye effect to a value. Let's try 50. And what it does it is it pretends to have a fish eye camera over the, um, over the costume. And if I set the fish eye effect to a positive number, it will enlarge the center part of the costume. If I set it to a negative value, it will make this part smaller. And now I could do that all the time based on an input of my mouse pointer. So for example, um, I wanna do that forever, but I don't wanna set it forever on 50, but I want to set it forever on the X position of my mouse. So now I made an interactive little script in which I can adjust the graphic effect on my screen. And it turned out that usually in workshops, kids like doing stuff with their images or images of their friends. Or for a long time, Donald Trump was pretty popular with that exercise. So there's different things that kids love to do with um, photos. So I highly recommend that. Okay, the next thing I wanted to mention, um, look for expandable projects. So the projects that I've showed you now are pretty simple ones um, and they are pretty much done at the point that they are in now. But there are other projects that allow a huge variety of similar ideas. One that I wanted to show you also uses the um, image as well. So it's a week we call it pointillism and some of you might have seen it before because it's one of my favorite introductory projects um, and it works like this so pointillism is an art style where you draw images by making differently colored dots so for example a tree would be represented by just green dots and the trunk would be represented by just brown dots and so on and so forth so we can use that technique to just redraw images of us, of our last holiday or whatever. Um, so it would work like this. Let me program it real quick. We also want to forever do something. Um, what we want to do 
is go to a random position. Ah, oh, wait, I have to do that in another sprite. Um, dim, dim, dim. We want to do that in uh, at a random position. And what we want to do there is measure the background color of the image and set our, our own pen color to that color. Um, this is also a nice exercise to talk about color models. Um, in Snap, we use the HSV color model. Um, and now we want to set this three components. So the hue, the saturation, and the brightness to whatever we measure at that position. Measuring stuff uh, usually works with blocks from the sensing category. There you can find all blocks that you need to interact with your environment. So the user, like whether a key is pressed, the mouse position and stuff. And you can also find information about other parts of your project. So for example, my neighbors would ask for other sprites in the vicinity. Um, in this case, we want to use the hue at <laughs> block and we want to input myself. So this measures the hue, saturation and brightness at our current position. And we now just want to set the pen color or pen hue to the hue that we're measuring, the saturation to the saturation and the brightness to the brightness. Um, if I do that, uh, I, I use the point towards block. That's not where I wanted. I wanted to go to random position block. What you can see now is I can make that a little slower um, that we're moving around and we're measuring the color and setting the color components accordingly. And now we just want to draw a dot at that position. So let me add a move zero steps. And before we want to put the pen down and afterwards we want to put the pen up again. So now I'm drawing, but you can't see it because the image is still in front of whatever I'm drawing on the stage. So I can just make that sprite invisible. And for that, again, we need graphic effects. I'll set the ghost effect to 100. Uh, and I clear again. And I'll do that again. And you can see that I'm drawing super small dots, um, but that's maybe a little small. So let's increase the pen size to something like 10. And again, you can see I can do that while the project's running. So um, now I set the pen size to 10 and I can recreate that image with just dots. The cool thing on at that project is now you can do the same thing by using your name. So I could just also not draw dots, but write my name. Or I could have different shapes like droplets that I could that I could program, or I could add different things like transparency, or I could have a threshold. Um, and when I'm below that threshold, I don't draw at all. So th this part stays white. And when I'm above that threshold, I just pick a random color. So I get more like a negative effect. Um, so this is a project that's perfectly expandable and you can do loads of things with it. With it. So I, by now I think most of my snap projects are versions of this one. Um, and it's really one of my favorite um, starter projects because it explains some blocks of the um, motion category of the pen category which is my favorite one anyway and it also uses interaction with other parts of the project and sensing stuff so i really like that okay one more thing have some backup ideas for faster students um there's usually students or participants in workshops that need a little more time and there's projects that are, again, expandable pretty easy, um, but they are also fun in a simple work version. What I really like to do for that, or what, what is a great illustration of that, is working or doing different spirals with the for loop. You can find the for loop in the control category, and you, you can use it to introduce variables, by the way, and also to draw um, great spirals. So for example, for I to 150, I want to 150, I want to move I steps, and then I want to turn. So for example, turn, I don't know, let's do more, let's do 121 degrees. Again, let's go to the center and let's put the pen down before, and maybe let's pick another color again. So if I draw, oh, and let's set the pen size to one again. And let's clear again and let's go to the center again and let's put the pen up. Okay, 
there we go. So um, I can draw spirals and some students can take forever to do that. Um, but they still like it and you can try different angles, but some of them just want to do more. And a really great thing that usually works is just animating things. So you have static drawings, but you can also just animate them. And the for loop works pretty easy. So what if you wouldn't just want to draw the 121 degrees spiral, but you wanted to start at zero degrees and then loop through all of them? You can do that by just creating another variable. So we'll do angle and we'll set the angle as I just mentioned to zero at the beginning. And then we wanna draw the angle spiral. Okay, let me try that. That's just a line because if I don't turn at all, I will just get a line. Okay, after we've done that, we need to go back to the center, face into the same direction, clear everything, change the angle and then do it again. Okay, so after we're done, as I mentioned, we need to clear everything, go back to the center and then um, point into the same direction. And after we've done, we need to change the angle by one. So let's try that. And if I click on that now, it works pretty okay. So now we wanna do that forever. Now we wanna do all of that forever. It's pretty fast actually. Yeah, that's because I have the turbo mode on. Um, you can see that when you don't have the turbo mode on that it draws every spiral step by step. So what you can do to avoid that is actually to turn on turbo mode how I just did it or include a warp block which lets you draw everything at once. So if we just put the four part that draws the spiral into a warp block, we get the whole spiral at once. So now let's try the same thing again. Here you can see that you animated the thing super easy and you can let work participants of your workshops on that while the others um, are still experimenting with the spirals if you want. And you could also do it a little faster then it looks more beautiful. Or you could hide the sprite. So that's something I would also recommend to you have different ideas as backups that faster students could do while the others are still working on the actual project. Okay. One more thing I wanted to mention also is don't be afraid. So we have different resources um, available. You can always go to the SNAP forum and ask stuff. We are usually there to help you. And what I found out in numerous workshops is that kids and most adults usually don't mind if you have, if you say, I don't know, but we can find it out together. Sometimes they even come up with their own ideas um, on what to do. Sometimes they just say, okay, then I don't do it. So don't be afraid. It's okay for them if you don't know. Okay, and with that, I think I would hand over to Jan who wants to tell you more about his art and SNAP curriculum that he developed together um, with different people at the University of Education Heidelberg. And if you have any questions, I haven't checked the chat yet, um, let me know, then we can answer them now. I think so far there are no questions in the chat, but maybe that's um, that's your time now. So um, we'll have, if you have any questions, raise it them now. And if not, um, we'll have some time later as well. Okay, I don't think so. No reaction on that. So we will hand over to Jan. Jan, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I will go on and I start sharing my screen now. Welcome to my presentation, everyone. I'm Jan Ebel and I'm working at the moment at the Didactic Actuell team, which is managed by Dr. Nicole Mame and Dr. Jens Peter Kniemeyer. And today I want to talk about our beginners SNAP course, Coding and Art. And first of all, I want to set the outline of this presentation. Uh, I will talk about coding and art 
uh, a, few, a quick overview. Then about the project itself and its containment like videos and exercises and the final projects students or especially girls have to do in our SNAP course. And at last but not least summary and some experiences. So what is coding and art? In coding and art, we combine the subjects art and computer science together uh, in the form of programming with SNAP. And we teach basic uh, programming concepts and there, there are three types of, first we teach them loops, which makes coding much easier. You see in the picture right now that I have to, to do a square. I need a lot of blocks to do so if I'm not using loops. And the next uh, concept is if constructs. I can, if constructs make it possible to do true and false, or I can ask the sprite to um, touch the edge of my screen to do something else. And the last thing we teach our students is picture editing. Like uh, Jatka has, has just shown you, um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, has just shown you uh, like it works to do such things with pictures to change the parameters of the color or the shadiness or the ghost effect. And we all combine this in our course to do, in our lessons to do this. And to give a quick overview of our structure, we do this, we, I will change to our um, homepage right now. So let me just do this quick. Um, so this is our homepage for our project Girls Digital Camps. And in this project, there are a lot of girls in all over Germany who partic participate in this project. And we teach them to do uh, SNAP programming. And they go to this site, which you we use as access point, and they go to Moodle. And if I click there and I'm logging in, it will show me the SNAP course. And the SNAP course was created by our team, Verena Konrad, Wiebke Thunfahrt, myself, Nicole Mame, and Jens Peter Kniemeyer. And with this, I give a quick overview. We have six, a six step program. We use an introduction to SNAP. Then we go to, to our first program with the students. Afterwards, we do the loops, then the if constructs, and finally picture editing. And last but not least, our final project. I will explain each section differently and I will start with the introduction. In the introduction center, we talk with the students about how they enter SNAP, how they work with SNAP and how they load, save or their projects and do this with an account. The next thing we do is we go to our first program. And in the first program, they have to do exercises and they are text-based in this format. And we tell them to do like a simple house or a square. And I want you, all of you now to enter SNAP and do this yourself. And I think I will give you five minutes for that. Um, so I will provide a link to SNAP in the chat and we will see your results in five minutes then. Can you say the exercises again in English maybe? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I want you to let the 
sprite draw a square in Snap. Okay, I can. I think I can do that. Thanks. Maybe as a quick hint for those of you who have really never before programmed in Snap, if you're clicking on the link, you um, then have to click run Snap now, I think. Then you're in the program. So are there any volunteers who want to show their results of this exercise? I think they can share their screen, right, Caroline? Okay. You can. I can start. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Um... Not so difficult. That's all. Exactly. That is uh, four lines, seventy five steps long, turn ninety degrees, and that's four time. Exactly. You already used the loop mechanic, and that's wonderful because students don't start in this exercise with the loops. They have to uh, use the blocks four times each and hang them um, together. I will start sh sharing my screen now to show you what the first solutions students come by with uh, will use. They use it like this. And I take the slow motion right now to show you the results and then after we introduce them to the loops they can use this kind of uh, solution but there's also more I want to share with you because the solution of one of the girls uh, got me very excited because it was I stated the, the task a bit differently they had only the uh, task to draw the square. And I never said how they can do it. And so one of the students came up with this. She was a totally newcomer to Snap. She never uh, programmed before, but she was a computer gamer in, and she loved to take control over her sprite. And so she used the arrow keys with an if construct in the first lesson, in the very, very first lesson, and drawed a square with her keyboard. It's not that perfectly square for me, but she was able to do it. And that got me very exciting because it shows how imagination is a very powerful, strong ally with the students. And we don't have to be afraid that students um, can't handle programming. They can perfectly handle it. And like I did just with you at the moment, that's how we work in the Snap, uh, in the snap Code of Art. We give the, uh, we take 20 girls in a Zoom room like here. And we split them up into four, uh, into teams of four or five. That's and we give them their um, their tasks. But before we hand out the task, they have the um, possibility to watch a movie, which we recorded ourselves and published of on YouTube, that they can get an introduction to each of the th themes. And we also use H5P um, contents that can explain the content of our lessons better to the students and a little interactive. 
like I will show you now, our first snap program. And they can click here on the small Alonso's to get text um, information about the future they will use in the future. Like this is the slow motion mode. These are the settings and so on. And we uh, created a few different kind of half MP in height at least. I have to find it right now. Yes, like this year. There are some uh, little tests as well, which the students have to solve. And now I want to show you our, oops, I'm sorry. That's what not what I intended to do. I show you our picture editing, like Yatka, we came with the with the simple idea to use the same strategy as her to teach students uh, picture editing in doing the same she did before with her picture. And the students can then use the turbo mode to get the picture as well and change the values in this type of program to get a bit of understanding how this works. And this all concludes then to our final project, the, in which the students have to create their own images or pictures they want to create. We are not giving them anything uh, other than this course to create their own um, artifacts. And I will show you two results of that in, oops, I'm sorry. two of the final projects as our students have made. First of all, they use the um, same loop, Jatka uh, introduced you to the I loop and put a dog in front of it. And on the other hand, they, they just let their imagination run wild to create something like that. And now I will summarize it to uh, thank you to our sponsors. At the moment, we are using SNAP in the Girls Digital Camp and in the Zora Zukunftsorientierungsakademy. And it is supported by the Klaus Chira Stiftung and the Baden Württemberg Ministerium für Wirtschaft, Arbeit and Wohnung. So, thank you all for your attention. And I'm now open for questions. And after that, I will hand over to Claire. So are there any questions? Can I maybe answer Tyler's question real quick because he wanted to know in the chat what we do for older teachers or older people like teachers <laughs> and uh, other adults. Um, and if I get the chance to show off some more projects, I will happily do so. Um, so let me share my screen again. Um, dim, dim, dim. Um, so I opened some of the projects that I have been doing with adults. Um, and this is what Jens already mentioned. We include 
like physical computing parts. Oh, wait, let me also turn on my camera. Then you can see why I'm talking. We include physical computing parts by accessing, for example, micro microphone um, samples from SNAP. And this, for example, is a, is a project to analyze the, um, or maybe this doesn't work because my microphone is, ah, it does work, is used by Zoom. Um, so here, for example, we can analyze the samples that we get from the microphone. This is something that physics teachers are really excited about. And we can also do the exact same thing with the frequency spectra. Um, so, it, and it's really fun also in um, musical education, music education, because you can try that with different instruments. Um, and that's something a lot of people are excited about. Um, one more project that I wanted to show is one I actually made yesterday. So I'm kind of proud of it. This is a, a recoding of the Schotter image from Georg Nees, a computer artist back from the 60s, 70s. Um, and this was one of his first images. And I also did the same thing. I connected the um, image or the colors of the image um, with the microphone frequency. So when I run that project, I can now change the color based on the frequency I'm measuring. And um, this is a project that's also part of Joachim Wedekind's book about um, algorithmic art, um, which he wrote about a course that he has been doing with like actually old people um, at a Volkshochschule class where um, they learned to program and they did that via this algorithmic art from the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and then that's also what Jens mentioned, color effects. Um, here we use higher order functions. So it's also advanced programming concepts to create different color effects on um, our images. So this is a picture that I took on vacation when we still could go on vacation in Ireland and you can uh, create different graphic effects on it. So here, for example, I enhanced the red channel and the green channel a little bit. So you get like a sundown effect here. Um, oh, that's another Im image. Um, you can, for example, think about how grayscale works by averaging all the color channels. Um, and this is uh, ah, sepia, um, also enhancing specific color channels. And this is a interactive um, posturizing effect where I basically just measure the brightness of an image. So this is something that also works great. And the last thing I wanted to mention is um, working with data. So this is a pretty small data set, um, but it uh, it's different species and the number of individuals that are still left of that species and then it's just a visualization so what I wanted to mention in general is data visualizations of actual data sets are something that work great with adults um, so this one for example um, shows images represented so the, the number of pixels in the image represents the number of individuals that's still left. So, so this, for example, is the giant ibis with just 200 birds left. Um, so data visualizations are also something that I highly recommend for doing it, them with adults. Thanks. Thank you, Jatka. I think one question is left in the chat. Um, if we can share the links to the tutorials, I think, and maybe Jan, you correct me if I'm wrong, we cannot share the exact digital camp links because it's just for registered um, kits, but you will afterwards receive a collection of, for example, all the shown um, projects today and to additional, additional material you can use afterwards to follow up on it. So you will receive it per mail and some also at the end in the chat. Um, exactly. Uh, I created a snap collection with all the pro or where we will add all the projects that we'll show today. <laughs> so I just <laughs> added some, uh, but you will get a link to that collection and can check out all the projects later. I think yeah, now they, there are four more, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, that's right. Cool. And to the restricted side, um, I talked with Jens Peter about that and he will make sure that if you want to get a look a better look into it, we can create um, demo accounts for you and just um, write an email to the first um, page email address. Perfect. I think that answers, I hope that answers your question, my God. And I think if no other questions are coming up, I will hand over to Claire for the gaming part now. 
Okay, then thank you so much. Um, I'm really impressed of what, what you can all do. I saw most of that before, but it's always impressing. Um, now, what I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, and I need to open my PowerPoint because I do start with PowerPoint. I'm really sorry, but that's, yeah, that's how SAP runs. Um, and I need to share it. Um, maybe a few words about me. I'm um, a development manager at SAP with, uh, with a development team and also a UA team, a user assistant team. Um, and I like sharing my knowledge and I've been a, a developer before. So um, I decided that I need to uh, definitely, uh, sorry, I need to concentrate here on my, on my sharing what I actually want to share. Okay. Now, here I go, here we go. Sorry. Um, and I really like programming and I wanted to share my knowledge with, um, with young kids and uh, kind of uh, show them how much fun programming can be and that it's not only for uh, boys and nerds. Um, so the one of the first projects that I did was uh, uh, now it wasn't the first, it was a longer one. Uh, that was, um, it's in German, it's called Arbeits AG. AG. Um, so it's, um, it's a club, a programming club in, in a um, high school here in, in my uh, location. And uh, because from seventh grade onwards, kids learn how to program in, in our part of the world, it's only for a year and it's very, little what they learn we restricted it to kids in the fifth and the sixth grade and they are usually between 10 and 12 something like that and what we also did is we said okay anyone can apply but we want to we did accept all the girls first in the end we had a class that was two-thirds girl and one-third boys and what we did is we started programming a game and um, they had no idea on, um, yeah, on programming at all, on Snap or whatever. And um, ah, that's about the workshop that I'm talking about. And um, so we started with very, very basic things. Um, here are some tips that I learned through various uh, workshops that I uh, had. So we, I usually restrict the number of participants to 10, but you need definitely two trainers if you have a workshop with 10 people. Um, then I know Yatka, you wrote in the chat that you usually start with 11. I try to do that always. So I tell people, please send only kids that are at least 10 or 11 years old, but um, it, happened a lot of times that there are also kids who are younger um, but at nine is is really kind of the limit because you need to be able to be very well read uh, uh yeah and read read the blog names and things like that and kind of have used a computer before so that's from my point of view that's the absolute minimum age um then if before you actually start your workshop and you talk to whoever you, you're organizing it with, find out which devices are available. That's always a, a topic. Um, try to have um, a device per person and max two per device. Um, otherwise, if you, especially if you have small, younger kids, um, they tend to, yeah, you tend to lose them at some point if there are three kids and on one, one uh, lap or one device. Um, I once had the situation that uh, the school, they had tablets, window tablets, they had no pens and uh, it was a real struggle to get anything to work. So do check these um, devices before you um, use them. Also uh, make sure that the appropriate browsers Pre or already installed there. So um, I think Yatka, you mentioned Chrome and uh, Firefox, and I'm not sure I haven't used Edge 
so I'm not sure if that works. Um, the, the new old... edge works because it's also based on Chromium now. So. Yeah, um, but in in German schools, you sometimes also still find the the Internet Explorer, the good old one Internet Explorer um, installed, and that doesn't really work. Um, so check out before you start your workshop <laughs> uh, that the devices are ready to be used. Then also um, check if there is an internet connection. If there isn't, make sure that the SNAP offline version is installed on all the devices that, that will be used. Um, that's also, um, yeah, just make sure that this, that's, that this is given. Um, and if you want to program games, you need a minimum of three hours from my from my experience. I'm not sure if anyone can make that faster, even especially if you have younger kids, but that's a minimum from my perspective. Um, okay, now what did we do in these workshops? Um, I added two agendas. This is the first one that would be if you have a three hour time slot and the next bit that uh, the next uh, agenda is more or less the second part of a possible workshop if you have more time. Um, now usually we have a, a classical welcome introduction of the workshop, the trainers, the participants, things like that. Then we'll have an introduction to SNAP and especially with younger kids it does take um, some time to get them used to. You always have the quick ones or the ones that have experience with other block-based educational programming languages, but you always also have those who are kind of new and don't dare to touch anything on a computer. So it, it usually does take a time. What we do is that we um, show them how to move an object, how to change costumes and things like that. So all the things that Jatka and Jan already introduced. Um, then we also do cross presentations because they're always kind of keen to show off what they've done. Um, and then we do one game together because um, if I only have three hours, we do this one ping pong game together. If we have more time, um, I, I want the kids to be kind of confident enough to start uh, yeah, doing their own ideas or, or yeah implementing on their own ideas. Um, also, um, check if, if you want to do that, check if you have a projector available or if uh, you can uh, um, have, uh, uh, how you call it in English, uh, so that you project uh, your screen to the other, to the participant screens. Um, so that's also something that you need to check beforehand. <laughs> Um, yeah, and with that, I want to start how uh, show you how I would start with a ping pong project, and um, I'm gonna share. I need to. Uh, hmm. Sorry, I'm kind of confused here now. Um, Okay, and that's something. Mm -hmm. So now I'm gonna start stop, uh, start sharing again. So ping pong game. That's the game where you have two players um, that um, are um, controlled by your arrow keys or the WASD, uh, w WASD keys. Um, so the one on the on the right side that I'm. Ugh. Ah, you can't see anything, right? Okay, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> um, okay, again, that's the ping pong game where you have um, two players on the, uh, on each side. So a player on each side. Um, the idea of the game is that this ball uh, moves around and the players, uh, yeah, it, no, it, it's not the players, uh, the players, uh, play it back and forth. If the ball runs out of one of the sides, it disappears and appears again in the middle. So that's the basic idea. You can add then counting of points if you have 
if you have a fast group or if you have some fast learners that you can um, advise how to do that. And um, yeah, so that, that's a very simple game. And I do that together with all the, all the students so that all of them have one game that they can actually play and they can play it with two people. Um, so when, when I start here, the classical one, and then I just move the ball up or and didn't touch it, and then it goes here back and forth. Um, this project is also in that uh, collection that uh, Jatka just mentioned. Um, I usually start with uh, creating the ball so that the ball moves around um, and that it bounces at the edges. So that's a very easy one. And I, it's not that I type it or that I show it on, on the script uh, here, but that I tell them, okay, how do we make that ball move? Um, how, what do we need to do so that it stays on the stage and doesn't disappear? Things like that. So the first thing that we do is we have the ball move. Then the next thing that we do is um, if the ball moves out on the right or the left side, it should disappear and appear in the middle again. Um, again, I ask or I describe the behavior that I expect and then I uh, collect the feedback that they give me. And um, after that, I show them my solution. Because as Jan already said, there are multiple solutions to all of the problems that we post. Um, after that, we start with uh, the uh, players on, the, on either side. Again, the same thing. And they uh, try to, to uh, play around that. Um, Ah, I did forget one thing. Um, when when we have the um, uh, the task that the ball should disappear and appear again, they also get to know how to create their own costumes and what a background is or the, the yeah the background of the stage is, and that's always that part actually does take a long time. So when they um, try to draw their background here. Um, that usually takes a long time, especially if they're young kids, because they're not used to using the mouse very, um, yeah, exactly. So that usually also does take up a lot of time. Um, so be patient, but they most of most of the times they do get it right. And this is a very plain and simple background. A lot of the kids they create wonderful backgrounds, like they have multiple colors or some. Uh, the clever ones then uh, actually find out, okay, you can uh, download the costumes to the stage and have a wonderful picture behind that. So um, it does take a t some time, but it's also something, especially for younger kids to get used to um, working with a mouse and used to creating something on their own. Now, um, As long as we're with the ball, we have this one sprite and this one um, script. Now with the players, you have two other sprites, which is also a concept that they need to understand. And um, I'm not sure yet, did you, do we add the video on, I have too many sprites uh, in the collect? No, we can't add I can in the video. collection. But I think we can send an email mm -hmm. around afterwards and I can add the link to the collection or I can let Caro add the yeah. link. Yeah, because at that point, it very often happens that a lot of students suddenly have hundreds of sprites. Um, so that's also a concept that needs a bit of explaining. Um, yeah, so and if we go there, that's actually very simple because these players just can move up and down, nothing more nothing else, that's all that they can do. And, um, but what a good thing is, it shows the students or the participants that they can actually control something on the screen themselves and they can control how to control that. So um, I usually say, tell them, okay, use for the, for the right player, use the um, arrows because that's on the right side of, of our keyboards and use the, 
we uh, WASD keys for the left one, but sometimes they also play around with other keys. Um, if you've come that far, that's already a very good um, timing. If you, if all the students have this, have have gotten this far. If you have fast ones, or if the whole group is very fast, you can then also go uh, and introduce the concept of variables, because you need that to uh, count points. Um, and I don't know why we don't see that actually. There, oh, now I can see. Hmm, that's strange. They were ticked, and I couldn't see them. Um, so you need variables to count points. And then uh, there are two ways of counting here, and you can either have the both or um, just decide for one of them. So if the ball moves out of the blue side, the player on the right side gets a point. Or the player on the left side gets one deducted. So whatever you want to, whichever way you want to play it. And or um, if a player touches the ball or, or catches the ball, so to speak, or plays the ball, that player gets a point. So there are various um, ways of how to collect points. Um, but in a three hour workshop, I think I never got them that far that they actually um, would count points. There were single uh, students who actually got that far, but these usually had some experience before with that before. Um, so that's the ping pong game. Now, how much time do I have left? Oh, I didn't start my what clock. Hmm. Anyway, you stop me, Caro, yeah, if I'm too long. <laughs> I do. I think you can show the second one of this. <laughs> um, now, before I go to back to my presentation, there's one thing that I like to mention because that uh, that's something that German uh, uh, teachers, trainers are concerned with. If you use the um, browser version, usually it shows in English first. Um, and so what you should do as a first, very first thing, tell the students how to change the language. So that's um, also, it's, it's very easy. And then all the blocks have the language that you selected. Um, another thing for you as a, as a trainer is um, you can actually enlarge the block size. So if you go here, you can enlarge the block size and then they, you can actually recognize them on a, on a projector. So if you have something like that, then suddenly everything is much larger and you can really recognize what you can see here or what, what, what is presented here. Okay, now every student, well, imagine every student uh, did get this far and they have a game and they usually have a lot of fun with that. Um, again, I usually have a cross presentation then. Um, you can still see my screen, right? Um, I added this here, but um, actually we don't need that because uh, Jatka and Jan already talked about that. That's some introduction examples. Um, usually we, at the end, we always have a cross presentation. And sometimes if you have uh, parents picking up the kids, they, they can also see what their kids actually did. Um, now, if you have a longer uh, time, if you have more time available, um, you can start trying to discuss with the kids what types of games there are. What types of games do they play? And um, I'm actually, I'm not a huge player, <laughs> I have to admit, but I like programming that, th these, these things. Um, so I'm really surprised of what types of games they play. But um, in general, there are well, probably there are more games like that. But these are the ones that came up. So there are games where you have to catch something. Um, there, I think yeah. we, I, I only see your snap screen. Is that how it's supposed ah, to? No, it's not. Okay. It's not. Sorry. Then I might want to share again. Uh, here we go. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so there are usually these types of games come up. So games where you catch something, games where you collect things, or they collect some gems or some, I don't know, flowers, some whatever. Um, and there are games where you shoot something. These are usually the types of games that they play. There are other types of games as well, but um, these are the ones that come up. Um, also, and that's something that I do at this point, they sometimes then expect, okay, we can uh, uh, kind of uh, program something like uh, Minecraft, or we can program something like, I don't know, what do they play? As I said, I'm not a huge player, but um, they often come up with uh, games that have wonderful UIs and wonderful graphics and things like that. Um, so at that point in time, you need to uh, do some expectation management and uh, yeah, make sure that they don't expect as, uh, that they really kind of have wonderful graphics. They can, but they're definitely different than the ones that they see in their games. Um, now, it depends on the group that you have. Um, uh, you can either decide that we have that everyone uh, uh, programs the same game, or you can have various groups. As I said, it depends on the group. So that's um, you have to be kind of flexible there. Um, when you've discussed all about these games, and then also um, uh, then decide which one you want to focus on. You should discuss what is the goal of the game. So these are kind of that's the requirements. So we collect these. Um, we also disc and that's a discussion that um, yeah kind of of uh, merges into each other. You then can also decide on how can we structure that game. So which objects do we need, and what do these single objects do? Um, so that's a, it can be up to two hours that you discuss without even programming anything. But that's something um, that we also, as developers, do all the time. So we just discuss more than we actually program. Um, and after that, when you, you when you clear on that, and it helps if you have a whiteboard where you can scribble it down or yeah, somewhere to take notes. Um, after that, you let them well, start and implement that game. And um, that's where you need the two uh, trainers most, because then you have to hop from one to the other and check what they're doing. When you're done, then you do cross presentation. I didn't include any breaks here because that's, uh, yeah, depends on um, what your setup is. Um, so that's how I usually structure my workshops if I do gaming workshops for kids. Um, yeah. I added here a link to a, a game that, that we developed actually in this very first um, workshop in, in that school. Um, it's Pac-Man style. So it collects something and it's it has some catching um, um, aspects in there. Um, and that, yeah, we, we can, I can just open it. Or maybe I, eh? Go to my. Can you see my uh, snap screen now? PowerPoint still. PowerPoint still. Okay, so I stopped sharing. So somehow I need to learn how to share in Zoom. So, ah, oh, and I have to click twice. Um, okay, um, we added it, and that, that's actually the collection. So you, do you see that? Okay. Um, and it's, I did it in German, that's why it's it's still called Hai and Papagai. Um, yeah, and uh, basically uh, one thing that I did myself is the stars. So if I start here, the stars clone themselves and actually they shouldn't, there should be, yeah. And then I can um, uh, move the, the shark and the shark collects stars. And as soon as the parrot comes there and touches the shark, 
it says uh, caught you. Or, oh no, I changed it. <laughs> the shark said, oh, I'm caught. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's very easy. And uh, uh, there are various concepts in here. And yeah, now the parrot has one. We also um, uh, count points here. Um, the shark can win as soon as all the stars are caught or, or eaten. And the shark can uh, get more life by eating the heart. And he can only enter it from the top. So he can't enter this, this little box uh, from outside. So it's similar to Pac-Man, but the graphic is completely different. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that is what I wanted to share with you. Um, now, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Oh, and I didn't check the chat. Thank you, Claire. No questions in the chat so far, I think, we, which we haven't answered yet. Mm -hmm. But now it's your time to ask. If not, maybe we deal it like beforehand. We will go ahead with Jakub. And if there are still questions coming up, just write them in the chat. Maybe we can clear, um, clarify them there. Or we will have time after um, Jakub has shown us um, the best practices from virtual uh, workshops set up. Um, mm -hmm. They talked a lot about live, virtual, uh, live workshops when they were still allowed. And now we will hear some best practices experience from Kuba. Thank you and handing over to you. So hi from my side too. Um... Yeah, my name is Jacob, and um, as uh, Caroline said, I will talk about somewhat general best practices on, on visual courses. So um, it does not rely specifically to SNAP, but um, is, it is applicable, of course, too. Um, uh, I am a working student at SAP with the IT Camps for Youngsters program where we um, have various courses for employee children. Um, we cover about 12 or 13 topics, I think, right now. Um, everything has to do basically with um, programming, computer, IT. Um, since March last year, um, all of Germany is in lockdown. So um, we needed to well, change to virtual too. And since then, we conducted 20 courses um, where each course uh, lasted a week and each day. It, um, so normally it's like a, a whole day course. Um, so we have the children um, in the classroom from um, eight to nine o'clock until about five o'clock. And we try to um, yeah, mimic this format uh, with the whole week course um, on the whole day. I will talk about it later. And we had about 15 to 30 participants in each course um, in the age range of eight to 18. So we're dealing with younger um, people uh, normally. Yeah. Ask questions, everybody has answers to. Um, I think most of us know this awkward um, silence in the beginning of the meeting um, when everybody's waiting and uh, I find it very good um, if we start already talking with the participants. Um, it doesn't matter which topic. Um, the main thing is that they um, start, you know, talking. They um, get used to talk online, especially if it's the very first session. Um, they may have been, I don't know, shy to talk, and it really helps to um, get to know each other and get the talk flowing and the good thing is that then afterwards um, it's easier for the participants to um, ask questions and they are more likely to answer to your uh, to your questions or ask questions themselves um, second thing have a co-host um, it depends uh, on which tool you are using but normally especially if you're sharing your screen um, you can't really see what's going on there. Um, first, we have the chat. Um, 
of course, if there are questions appearing in the chat, um, it's important that somebody um, answers them or tells them to the presenting um, person. And it's much easier if there is a second person who you know, can somehow filter the chat and see what's important there, um, what's maybe just fun, or even um, if the chat starts to explode and um, like with uh, kids, it's uh, pretty often actually that they start talking about um, some games they're playing and then they start, you know, discussing um, their high scores. And um, if you have a meeting with 30 kids and then two of them start discussing in the um, official chat, it's uh, very confusing for the others. So we also had to disable the chat um, several times um, to, you know, to get the focus back on the meeting. Um, the raising hands issue, um, it's also very hard to see that. Again, it depends on the tool. Um, I think Zoom um, has improved it by now, but it used to be um, that uh, you couldn't see who has raised the hand when you were presenting. So also for that, um, you need normally a second person who, uh, yeah, kind of a moderator who says, well, there are people um, who have questions. And also, um, I think we tend to forget that sometimes there may be participants who haven't um, really reached the meeting because of technical issues, because of, I don't know, but um, there may be emails incoming um, also, if it's, um, it depends on, on the participants, but um, there may be maybe calls incoming. Um, so it's good if not the phone of the presenter is ringing, but there's again, a second person who can answer the call, uh, maybe resend the meeting link, whatever. Um, make sure uh, the participants um, are somehow still with you. Um, ask them questions, um, try them to, um, you know, to repeat what you said, um, or maybe repeat in their own words. Um, and I think really try to motivate them not to only write in the chat, but also um, to speak to you. Um, maybe if, if uh, maybe with their camera on, um, it's always much nicer if um, you can see the participants because um, often you can you know, see in their mimic whether um, they understood what you're talking about, whether they are, whether they are um, still with you or whether you lost them. Um, I think um, it is important to um, not hesitate to change the schedule because um, if half of the class didn't get what I talked um, about, it's no, it's not worth it to be on schedule, but to have lost everybody in, in the end. So um, if really questions come up and it's not um, simple questions or, or questions which can, which really, um, where you can really see that somebody just didn't listen and it's something which is written somewhere. Um, but if they are really understanding questions, then I think it's very important to stop there and to go back, explain again, and make sure that everybody is back on track, uh, even if that means that um, you can't reach your desired outcome. I am aware that that can be very problematic in um, like one-time um, workshops, if it's just one hour. Um, of course, you don't have the, the possibility to um, do something someone someone else because um, it's just that one meeting. Um, but still, um, for the moment, I think it's very important to you know, go, go back and make sure everybody has understood what you said. Um, I think it's the biggest thing I've learned this year. Um, to have a good virtual course, it does not work to um, take the on-site course and just share the PowerPoint presentation and talk. Um, it is very different on how we work in the virtual course and how we work in the classroom. Um, I think it is important to really create an online course. 
we, we have the same topic as the on-site course, but we basically need to start from the beginning and um, rethink when we are talking about what, um, um, which which content is important, which content can be maybe uh, put aside and be marked as um, for experts only. Um, and then, um, so what happened to us is that we come came up with pretty different um, course schedules to that what we what we used to do um, in our on-site courses. Um, but still, we maintained the topics covered. So um, basically, the, the the amount of of information um, the participants learn during the week stayed the same, but it's um, you know ordered differently. Let's say. Um, What is there um, to, to consider is that participants often have only one screen. So they can either see what you're sharing or you uh, or they can um, do their own stuff. With kids, normally it happens that they start programming on their own. Um, so it is quite important to stress it again and again that um, they should, you know, watch what you are doing and then of course, you need to give them time to also practice on their own. So you can't do like four hours of virtual course and um, expecting the kids to, to work um, or the participants to work um, in the same way like in a classroom. Um, what we are doing uh, to get this, our meetings are uh, usually between 30 and 45 minutes uh, long, depends on the course and on the age of the participants. Um, but after that, it's like 45 minutes is really the maximum of, um, you know, input what the kids or the participants can get. And after that, there is at least one or two hours for the participants to um, not just have the break, but also to really try out um, what they just did in the, um, in the learning sessions. Of course, during this time, there needs to be um, some uh, possibility for the participants to ask questions um, to get back because um, during this process there will be questions. Um, again, in on-site courses, um, it's pretty easy because um, you, as a trainer, can you know walk around and help the participants um, while doing it. Um, this does not really work during online courses. Um, of course, you can. Uh, have like help sessions and you can stay online and um, you know answer questions if there are if there are questions coming up. Um, what we do in our courses is we use a, a forum where participants can um, post their questions. So um, nobody needs to be you know online the whole day um, and it works pretty well, I think. Also with the younger children, um, it works. They make screenshots, they um, well post questions, and then the trainers are, are trying to answer that. And only if like something really heavy comes up, then um, we open the meeting again and um, try to uh, yeah solve it face to face. Um, also, um, the PowerPoint presentations um, we use normally for you know, presenting, like whilst talking, are not suitable for um, the participants to you know, have a look back at them again. So um, what is really good is to have a kind of handout or something even bigger to give the participants so they can, um, yeah, they have something to take with them and to have a look at after the course has ended. Or also during the course, um, if there are like questions and um, they don't know exactly how the turning of the sprite maybe um, is working in Snap, 
so um, they can um, look it up. I think this is important, especially for younger participants, because they usually don't know the concept of Googling um, something you need. I guess um, with older participants, it's not that a problem, but um, yeah, the youngers need to learn it. Um, we often have the situations um, that we ask, are there questions? And nobody says anything. And then um, after a couple of hours, uh, the questions start appearing in the um, forum. And um, it's questions uh, which could be answered like really quick during the sessions. And um, sometimes, yeah, it's just not worth it. So um, we learned that often participants um, just are shy or hesitate, especially younger ones. Um, they um, maybe don't want to talk in public. They are afraid to um, say, it in public that they didn't understand it because of like 20 other kids watching them. So um, Zoom is uh, very good for that because there is the private chat possibility with the host. So participants can um, write to the host privately. I think this does not work in Teams. But again, it depends on, on the um, tool you're using. Um, also in breakout rooms, um, participants who are normally not talking and their video is off, they tend to start talking in the breakout room when it's just one-on-one um, -on -one with a trainer. And <clears throat> this is also for you as a trainer much easier if the participants, if, the, yeah, if they talk to you because it's just faster. If they you know, talk about their problem instead of typing it in a chat and then you ask back a question and you're waiting again 20 seconds until they typed again the answer in the chat. This all happened, it's very, um, Nerving. Also, um, we try not to ask, are there any questions, but um, we try to say um, something like send a thumbs up if you um, have understood that. Um, we can try it out now. So everybody has seen the reactions uh, function. It's um, down at the bottom of your screen. There is a reactions function. Um, you can send thumbs up. Um, I think by now Zoom has updated um, some more um, reactions, uh, which is actually pretty cool to, um, you know, somehow get the general mood of the participants. Um, yeah, and I think last, be patient, um, especially with the younger ones. Um, they often ask questions at a totally wrong time. Um, it's like you're 10 minutes into the next topic and then they ask back just a question to a topic you know you've been talking on before and um, I think in in my adult thinking I'm like why why did you just ask it before but totally somewhere else now but um, I try to stay calm and um, just explain it again or maybe um, if it's like really off topic, I try to you know push it to after the session when the recording has stopped and um, when the other ones are free to leave, then we can um, talk about it again. Yeah, I think uh, that would be it from my side. Um, Carol, maybe back to you for thank now. You. And... Yeah, thank you. Um, this was the last official talk and now we have still time left for your questions to all of our speakers of course so um your chance and i've just learned that i have to wait a bit maybe um yeah if there are some questions left just ask them now this is your chance Maybe we try the reaction thing. If you don't have any questions left, just send a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, many thumbs ups coming in. Um, yes, then I will maybe leave it like it is and we will um, give you back some time today 
but first of all, maybe I would, or not maybe I ask you to stay another one or two minutes. First of all, thank you, Jadga, Claire, Jan, and Jakub for this great session and that you took the time. Um, I think it was very helpful and um, yes, thank you. The second point I want to make is that I want to share with you two options to maybe follow up on today's session. The first one is the great open SAP MOOC on building up own workshops. You will receive the link in the chat and as well per mail afterwards, um, together with the recording and the um, playlist and the collection and so on. But I want to highlight it especially today because it's exactly maybe what you're looking for right now. If you want to build up your first um, workshop, if you're looking for some other themes to um, integrate in workshops and so on, have a look at it. Um, it's a self-paced learning course with um, videos, with PDF material and so on. Um, yes, I think that's it for the MOOC. It's worth a look at it. And the second point I wanted to um, make here is that we are planning to do a SNAP and art event at the Digital Tag in uh, Germany. It's a full day theme day around education in digital um, surrounding or around digital digitalization. Mm -hmm. And we are looking for some interested SNAP coaches if you want to get active now. So it will be something like a hybrid um, format and the organization will not be on your side. And if you're now excited on trying out SNAP and art in this uh, context, we would be happy to uh, get a mail from you to the Young Thinkers um, inbox, um, paste it in the chat, I think, maybe um, someone can type it in again, but um, you have the mail in every uh, mail I sent you before. Um, it's the youngthinkers at sap.com inbox. Um, yeah, if you want to contribute here or support here, um, that would be great. So just write a mail. And another thing, and I will quickly start sharing again. Some, oh no, I didn't want to. Um, share this. I want to share this. The ones who have been in the past trainer Thursdays so far already know this uh, procedure. We um, wanted to um, get a little bit of feedback from your, uh, from you now um, after every trainer Thursday. And I ask you now to take the next 30 minutes. We will have a short timer here to write your learning of the day in the chat. What was your most important learning or new learning, um, write it, tell us in the chat. I think the timer doesn't work out. That's a pity. Oh, yes it is. <laughs> okay. More powerful than I thought I see in the chat as a feedback. I'd like to ask a question. Yes, of course. Um, what is the best way to get in contact to kids or students to, to start such a workshop? I think there are some different um, options for it. Um, if you have, uh, we have had the case in the in the past that um, someone just goes into a school of the kids or niece or something and just go there, ask, get in contact with teachers or um, so on. And if the other option is, of course. Um, by our SAP Young Thinkers uh, community. We have some teachers and member schools who are always looking for um, engaged um, ambassadors who want to um, go into schools and give workshops. This is a little bit more um, well received in not Corona times. I think some of the schools are now not that open for additional input, <laughs> but in the real um, 
on-site workshops, it is working out with um, kids um, in, in normal, normal school classes. And the other way is, of course, um, uh, through our events we are organizing, there will come up a, um, another Young Thinkers Learning Festival in summer where we will have many participants and also for this, we'll be looking for some <laughs> workshop uh, leads. You will hear it about. Uh, you will hear about this as well if you're um, part of our community. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, I already had contact to a computer science teacher here at the gymnasium. Don't know what's in English, <laughs> gymnasium. Um, and they ask for for teachers to to give workshops as well in the in the. Uh, second half of this year. Maybe I can start there. Great, absolutely. Okay. I see a lot of learning of the days today. Um, I think this is very impressive and shows us once again um, how impressive SNAP is. And I hope you are all um, curious and now excited for your first workshop. Um, I want to point out another thing. The Trainer Thursday sessions are monthly sessions. So of course, also in May, we will have a session, um, which will this time be more of the business process um, topic than the actual SNAP coding. So we will have the session from ERP to Learning Factory. Um, where the SAP for School and Festo Didactics will show how you can make SAP or ERP systems um, tangible for students via a um, learning factory, which is a model factory you can Im um, implement in schools and use, and the students can trigger them themselves and get into ERP. Uh, software. So if this excites you, just check out our Trainer Thursday platform for the next registrations. And um, of course, um, tell your friends and colleagues um, if you have some in mind who might be interested in, in this as well. And with that, and we've had the topic of um, some awkward silence at the ending. I want to end this session with an impression for maybe another workshop. Um, this is a cool snap workshop, which I think Ben now was it, um, who shared it. Maybe this is the last impression I want to give you today. And with this, thank you all for joining, stay healthy and see you next time. <laughs>